In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The lessons this morning, it seems to me, have a lot to say about election, privilege, and mission. And I'm not talking about our national electoral process. While election, as a general concept, does have to do with choosing something or someone, the real question is, who does the electing? Certainly in the U.S., we've been wrapped up in that question since the early days of our nation. Enshrined in the Constitution, of course, is that whole debate-worthy institution of the Electoral College. I'm not going to debate the college's worthiness, but behind our system in general is the idea that the people choose. The people elect. And related to that is the theory that the people settle on the mission or direction the country should adopt. That is not election in the biblical sense. In both Testaments, election is what God does with God's people. There is no democracy. There is one elector, God. God enters into covenant with a people. And while there are mutual obligations, the covenant is unilateral. Its terms are set by God. The, pimp, the people simply say, yes. This is well illustrated in our reading from Exodus. But what led up to that moment? It all started with another covenant, another election, Abram's. For some reason, not spelled out in Genesis, God chose Abram to be the ancestor of a great people, through whom, as Genesis 12 puts it, all families of the world would be blessed. Abram agreed. In accordance with the promise, he had children. Through a series of unfortunate events, those children ended up in Egypt. For a while, things went okay for them. Then, as Exodus states, a pharaoh arose who did not know their history and enslaved them. In time, Moses was commissioned by God to lead that covenant people, the descendants of the Abrahamic covenant, out of bondage. The Israelites departed Egypt and began their journey to the Promised Land. One of their first stops was at the foot of Mount Sinai. What we heard this morning is the account of the establish of another subsequent covenant. And it was in my rereading of this account that some things emerged that I believe are important for us to hear. First, God told Moses to remind the Israelites what their experience had been. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Then God set the terms of the covenant. If you obey my voice and keep my commandment, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine. To be clear, Exodus implies that God had other peoples from which to choose. Israel was God's choice out of that multitude. And then the kicker. The whole earth is mine, God says, but you shall be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And as we heard, the people all answered as one, everything that the Lord has spoken we will do. Interesting. The people hadn't received the precise terms of the covenant, the Ten Commandments or the rest of the law, they have simply agreed to do what they needed in order to be God's treasured possession. The Israelites agreed to become for God a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And this is where I was really stopped cold. What might that mean? To be a kingdom of priests. And by the way, the NRSV that we just heard is the only translation that translates the Hebrew as priestly kingdom. What does it mean if the entire nation, the entire people, 
is a kingdom of priests. So I did a bit of research to remind myself of the function of the priesthood in antiquity in particular. Without going into a lot of detail, priests did two things. First, they would put their God on display. Think, for example, of bringing out a statue of the God for the people to honor, or even of dressing in special garb to show the God's favor. And second, priests would mediate between the gods and the people. They would offer sacrifices or prayers on behalf of the people. They would interpret signs and texts to, to convey the God's intentions for the people. So if Israel itself was a kingdom of priests, to whom would they show God? Secondly, if Israel itself was the priesthood, between God and who else would they mediate? What seemed clear to me is that Israel's role as a kingdom of priests was to represent God to the nations, the rest of the whole earth that was God's. Israel, too, was to mediate between God and those nations. To be clear, the Aaronic and Levitical priesthood set up in the rest of the Torah are distinct from this national priesthood. Those were more internal roles addressing Israel's relationship with God. Israel as a whole, Israel's relationship was responsibility was to handle the world's relationship with God, to give evidence of the covenant that had been established. In addition, Israel was to be holy, distinct, both in and of itself, but also to the nations. In other words, Israel was elected brought into covenant relationship with God, not for its own benefit. Although there were often times in Israel's history when they thought their chosenness gave them special privileges. We read that in the Psalms all the time. No, Israel was elected, brought into covenant relationship with God for the benefit of the other nations, just as the covenant with Abram had been established. Israel's election had implications. And those implications were not just that they needed to follow the law, but rather that Israel follow the law and demonstrate to the rest of the world just what being treasured by God would look like. Unfortunately, as we know, despite the people's assent to the terms of that election, Israel's history became a litany of failures in witnessing to the covenant. Another story of election and mission is found in our reading from Matthew's Gospel. Prior to the story we just heard, Jesus had appeared on the scene and begun his mission. He taught crowds. He healed the sick and cast out demons. He calmed a raging sea. He began upsetting the Pharisees. And in all of that, he gathered a lot of followers. Yet out of all of those people, he chose twelve. And he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. In other words, Jesus entrusted them with the mission with which he had been entrusted. Yes, they too were privileged by their election, and we see some misunderstanding of that when the disciples wanted to exclude others or when they argue about who should be at Jesus' right hand. Some Christians to this day also seem to want to claim some sort of pride of place. But that was not what Jesus wanted for his followers. He wanted them to go to the lost sheep, that is, the marginalized, the non-privileged. And the apostles' task was to raise up those sheep. In the passage we heard, that initial mission was directed to those lost sheep, those who the current priesthood had left out, but as Matthew's narrative goes on, the circle widens until in the Great Commission of Matthew 28, the remaining apostles are told, in words echoing Exodus 19, all authority in heaven and on earth has given to me, or the whole earth is mine. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, or be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In these two stories, we see that God chooses who God chooses. And God chose, charges those elect with a mission, a mission not to revel in the specialness of being chosen, but to leave the safety of being the elect for the benefit of the nations. The mission is to represent a compassionate and just God, a God who wants all people to have unclean spirits cast out and to have every disease and every sickness cured. There's one more similarity be between these two lessons, the contexts behind the stories. The Exodus account stands on its own, certainly, a story of deliverance from bondage, along with the establishment of the covenant and its responsibilities. Most scholars, however, believe that the story was written down during and after the Babylonian exile and the Jews returned to Judea, that is, some seven or eight hundred years after the departure from Egypt may have happened. In other words, the election was set in a time of disruption, either the leaving of Egypt or the leaving of Babylon. And while the people in either telling may have anticipated a time of rest and stability ahead, God immediately gave them a mission. Likewise, Matthew's gospel reflects a time of disruption the Roman rule in Judea had the Jews nervous and unsettled. There was clearly an expectation that all could come crashing in at any moment. And indeed it did, both in terms of Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection, but also with the destruction of Jerusalem and the dispersal of thousands of Jews from Judea. One might expect that in such circumstances, the normal response would be to hunker down and wait for things to sort out to await normalcy. But that was not what Jesus charged his elect to do. Whether it was in the passage we just heard about going to the lost sheep and casting out unclean spirits and to cure every disease and every sickness, or that great commission to go to all the world with much the same message, the early Christians, set upon as they were, knew that it was then that was the time to be on mission. Some decades after Matthew wrote his gospel, another early Christian author wrote a letter to a group of new converts in Asia Minor, converts who were suffering because of their faith, who were vulnerable, who were frightened. Yet the author of 1 Peter reminded them of their election in their context. Hearkening back to Exodus, he wrote, you are a chosen priest, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. Why? In order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Again, times of trial, times of turmoil are not the time for God's elect to wait for better days. On the contrary, they are the times to strike out in mission. The question, of course, for us, uh, in the turmoil and disruption that is COVID land, is how do we claim our role as a kingdom of priests? How do we represent God to the people around us, the lost sheep of our neighborhoods, who aren't being attended by other authorities? How do we carry their concerns to God and carry God's compassion and justice to them? What is our role in casting out the unclean spirit that may lay behind racism? What is our role in mediating peace amidst the divisiveness that grips our wider nation? How do we, as a kingdom of priests, set aside our privilege as the elect in order to proclaim jubilee to bring others into Christ's marvelous light? Jesus went out with that mission, people 
flocked to him. From where we are today, we may be able to see the border of COVID land in the distance to anticipate crossing out of it. And when that day comes, it will be wonderful. It will be wonderful to join together as a community in the Eucharist. But as much as we will be privileged to receive the body and blood of Christ in a few months, we must not forget our election to be the body and blood of Christ now. It is that body that Jesus sends out to proclaim the good news, cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. May we answer as one. Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Amen.